This is a house of amazing women. I love, I love what uh, God is doing in this area. It's kind of like uh, a secret weapon. Martinsburg, West Virginia. People have no idea what's really happening here. Uh, that's exciting for me. So uh, I, was, I had some time with some of your leaders at lunch and they're just amazing women. And we were talking about some different things and I'm hoping we can fast track a couple of things tonight. I can talk fast if you can listen fast. I believe that the Holy Spirit can do some things very quick. And I was talking to my, my third born son and his wife today and uh, Alec has a little bit of a learning disability uh, where he's dyslexic, where he sees things in pictures rather than in words. And when you see things in pictures, you actually uh, learn more faster than you can actually speak. And so I decided to open up with a picture, a short video for you. I'm gonna put up the Fight for Female trailer. We're gonna put it up really quick. Have you ever dreamed of dragons? I have. These dragons had tricked women into believing their ancient enemy had become a friend. But from the genesis of time, there has only been enmity. Revelation 12 speaks of the dragon who wars against the woman and her offspring. Threatened by our divine purpose and design, the serpent degrades marriage and motherhood while sexualizing and minimizing the wonder of our female form. He told us men were the problem when all along he's been in the shadows. He wants to divide and distort because he is scared of what we carry. The poet Matthew Arnold said, if ever there comes a time when the women of the world come together purely and simply for the benefit of mankind, they will be a force such as the world has never known. I believe now is that time. I believe we are those women. Together, we can reclaim our divine identity. It's time to join the fight, the fight for female. All right. And you guys bought all of the books, so we have none of the books left. Uh, but I wanted you to get a weight of this moment. We are living in a weighty moment. We are living in an exciting time. We are living in a time period where other generations would have loved to be alive in our moment. And so I want to punctuate your life with the urgency. I want you to understand you are not wrestling with flesh and blood, but you are wrestling with evil that is beyond compare. We are wrestling with something that is terrified that women will wake up and remember their divine form and identity. You know, I, uh, I was not an easy daughter. I drove my mom pretty much crazy. And I remember my grandmother giving me something that was so cool in the 70s, a serpentine necklace. It wasn't a short one, it was a long one. I could double it up and wear it as a choker. And I thought I was the coolest person ever. I was 15 with a 14 karat gold, real gold necklace. And I remember overhearing my mother tell my grandmother, don't give it to her. She won't know how to value it. And I thought, my mom just wants the necklace. <laughs> but you know what? She was right. Because I wore it for a while, but then I was in a hurry one day, and I threw it in a drawer with my toothbrushes and my hairbrush and my toothpaste. And I remember I went to shut the door, and the door just wouldn't shut right. So I slammed the drawer shut. And I came back from between my sophomore and junior year in college, and I went rifling through the drawer looking for my necklace that my grandmother had given me, and I couldn't find it. And I just, I pulled out all the drawers. I looked everywhere. I thought it fell into the cabinet base. And I began to yell for my mom, 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 I can't find the necklace Grandma gave me. And she said, oh, I have it, I have it. And I said, oh, good. 
She said, but I'm keeping it. And I said, why? And she said, because you bent it out of shape. And she showed me that when I slammed the drawer, I had actually bent a section of the necklace where it never laid correctly. And what is so interesting is when I look at our femininity, I feel like we have thrown it into the drawer with a lot of things that it did not belong with. And now it is bent out of shape. And the chain that connects both male and female, the chain that connects both mother and daughter has been broken, has been bent out of shape. You know, uh, recently, a friend of mine lost her mother. And I don't know if you know this, but you were not just in your mother's body. You were actually in your grandmother's body. Your grandmother's eggs were the eggs that produced your mother and passed on eggs to her, and she passed it on to you. But I am seeing a breaking in the relationship with mothers and daughters, and we need to see a healing in that relationship. If we're going to do it as women, united in purpose, there cannot be jealousy, there cannot be comparison, there cannot be a breach between the generations. You know, I am the mother of four boys, which I thank God for every single day. My daughter-in-law, Juliana, she called me recently because I have a teenage granddaughter, and she said, you mother of boys, you're not even mothers. You don't even understand what it is to navigate a period with a teenage girl. And I was like, you're right, I don't. I was really happy about that. She's like, you guys all get a pass. I like, I knew that. Because I had been such a difficult daughter that whenever I was acting up, my mom would say, I hope you have a daughter just like you. And because I was an idiot, I would say, I hope I do too. <laughs> then I became a Christian and I was like, heck no. I do not want that daughter like me. I want, actually, I want no daughter. I want to go for all of the sons. And for years, decades, I actually bonded with my audience by saying, how many of you in here don't like women? And they'd all put their hands up. They were like, I don't like women. I'd be like, I don't like women either. We would all bond about our dislike of women. But what we don't like in women were the very things that we were never fashioned to be. We were never fashioned to be petty. We were never fashioned to be divisive. We were never fashioned to be weak. Do you understand how strong women are that we actually conceive and carry life and then nurse a baby? Like it is amazing when you think about what God actually entrusted us with. Where the, one of the reasons why the enemy hates women so much is because we carry life. And he hates it that we carry life. We carry life, we birth life. And so he has attacked our very intimate partnership with God. And so I'm going to maybe step on some toes, but I feel like I have to say some things because right now we are not navigating mother and daughter well, and we are not navigating male and female well, and we're going to have to actually get better at both. Yeah. So I live in Franklin, Tennessee, which is a Christian bubble. And I went out to a coffee shop and I had a t-shirt on. I think they're going to put up a picture of it. I have a t-shirt on that said, the future is male and female. And while I'm sitting in the coffee shop, I had some men coming up to me saying, thank you. Thank you for including us in the future. I said, you're welcome. You're welcome. I've, I've decided to include you. And then I had some women that were like, hey, I need that t-shirt. 
And I'm like, okay, I, it was actually a conference I spoke at. I don't even know if it's available. So I am wearing this T-shirt, and I'm thinking, everybody's happy. I'm just going to do a selfie with this T-shirt. So I sit in my car. I put sunglasses on because I do believe in makeup optional. I believe that sunglasses are makeup. So I put a little lip gloss on. I took a selfie, and then I just put it up, and I wrote, the future is male and female because without male and female, there is no future. You guys, that's your parents. I don't know if you, I mean, this is not deep. This is not like, I, I, this was not deep and meaningful. 922 comments later, people getting angry with me. You are co-signing with patriarchy. How dare you co-sign with patriarchy? Jesus would never believe in the oppression of women. People saying this is a demon of hate. This is a transphobe comment, homophobe. This is anti-LGTBQ. And I hope nobody gets mad at me, but they even said it was a racial comment. And I'm like, whoa, I could not believe nine 122 comments. First time ever I was called a bigot. Just for saying the future is male and female. Because without male and female, there is no future. So I decided that anytime there is this much of a disproportionate reaction to something, there is something more behind it. So I just went home and I typed into Google, what is the origin of the quote, the future is female. And a Washington Post article from 2015 came up and it explained the origins of the quote, the future is female, was from a lesbian separatist group called Labrys. You think, what's, what's Labrys? Well, Labrys is the two-headed ax carried by the Amazons and the Greek and Roman goddesses. And they said the future is female was a spell to cast a call to war, an invocation. 25% of their proceeds, not profits, go to Planned Parenthood. So they have human sacrifice. They have Greek and Roman goddesses. They said that males should not be lived with. They said heterosexuals should live separately. And y'all are gonna get mad at me, but Hillary Clinton brought it back into our presidential campaign in 2015. So every time you saw a, the future is female, it was that force behind it. Right after I saw, and you like, well, Google it. Right after I saw this, my grandson showed up at my house. He's 14, he lives down the street. He walks in, they go right for the pantry. And I said, Asher, Asher can, I, can I ask you a question? And he said, sure. I said, what are your thoughts on the quote, the future is female? He said, that I'm unnecessary. Is that what we want to say to our sons, to our husbands, to our brothers, to our friends? to our fathers, to our coworkers, that you are unnecessary. But what was really sad was there was actually a lot of women that said, yeah, that's exactly what I wanna say. Because I felt that people made me feel unnecessary, therefore I, it is time for them to feel unnecessary. Guys, there is no one who is unnecessary. Every single person has value and purpose and the future includes everyone. No one is left out, no race, no gender. Right now, the suicides are the highest they've ever been for young men 24 to 35 years of age because they feel like they have no purpose, no purpose. You say, well, what does this have to do with me? Oh, see, we have a divine origin. We have a divine origin. God is the one who said, it's not 
good for the man to be alone. Long before there was a fall, there was a problem. And God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And so God and the man partnered. And God is the one that brought Eve out of the man. Actually, at the time, they were Ish and Isha. That was their name. Their names were so closely related, they reflected one another. He wasn't named Adam. And she wasn't named Eve until after the fall. She became what she did instead of how she was related to the man. But they were two sides of the same coin. I want you to think about that. I am not a coin collector. But if a coin is to be valued, you cannot have one side perfectly intact and then the other side defaced. God is looking at both male and female, and he is saying, I need value and protection and honor and worth added to both sides. We are an answer to be embraced, not a problem to be controlled, but we believe that we were a problem rather than an answer. So we took on the nature of men rather than leaning in to the divine entrustment of woman. Do you understand that when God created woman, she was the very last thing he ever created? That's not because she was an afterthought. It was because she was a necessity. God said her origin has to happen. And then after that, God said it is so very, very good. We are no longer under the fall where women are striving for the posture of a man and a man is oppressing the women. You have leaders in this area that are giving both the men and the women full permission to be everything that God created them to be. But it will not happen with anger and rage and vengeance. We have to put all of that away. You know, I, uh, I've been in the ministry now for over 40 years. And I never, ever wanted to be on a platform. I was thrilled that my husband was out there and I was great with editing him because what wife doesn't love to edit their husband? I'm like, I would love to edit you. Give me your manuscripts, I will work on those. And so I, I was great with that, but I never wanted to actually go out on the forefronts on my own. And to be honest with you, I really didn't have a lot to bring. I remember I'd had my first son. How many of you just have one child wave at me? Yeah, see, one child is an accessory. You take them out, you dress them up, they behave well. It's all a trick to get you to have more children. I remember when I had my second child, I thought, will I ever brush my teeth before noon again? What have I done? What was I thinking to get pregnant again? I just remember feeling like my whole life was out of control. I also made the decision that I wanted to stay home with my baby. So when I was pregnant, I said, I'm gonna, with my second son, I said, I'm gonna stay home because I put my firstborn son back into daycare when he was four weeks old. And I went to work and I pumped my breasts and I fed him, you know, I went and nursed him on my lunch hours. And I remember I was so stressed out that I would have to try to relax and I would get in the bathtub and have just my nose above the water and my husband would come in and be like, what are you doing? Do you need to take your medication? My husband would be like, what are you doing? And I'd be like, I am trying to relax. And he'd be like, you look like you're trying to drown yourself. And I'm like, it's kind of close. And so I, I remember I thought submerged with just my nose isn't working. We had an apartment. I thought I'm getting a shower massage. Now I got a shower massage and I would try to let the shower beat down my shoulders. Back then, I was working full time. 
I was making the most money. John was working part-time, praying all the time, reading his Bible. I wanted to slap him. And I was like, I, I, I would say, I need you just to bring the baby to childcare. Get the baby there at eight. He'd show up at nine. The lady would tell me, and he hadn't changed the diaper. Or he forgot the frozen breast milk. And so what did I do? I'll just do it all. Now my shoulders were attached to my ears. And so I'm taking a shower to try to relax myself down. And I'm in the shower, and I hear God say to me, first time he talked to me in a really long time, he said, you don't think John is a good head of the household, do you? I said, I know he's not. He said, you think you can do it better? I said, yeah, I totally can do it better. He said, I've made you the head of the household, Lisa. It's a yoke to you, but it's a mantle to John. Throw it off. And I thought, if I throw that off, the diapers and the garbage are never, co like it's gonna go up to the ceiling. There is gonna be a problem. This is gonna be a nightmare. And I heard John likes you doing everything. All he's ever known is a mother. And you're treating him like he's a child. And all of a sudden, all these conversations where I thought I was so funny and so smart got replayed in my mind. And I remembered how my husband, who had once leaned into me, was leaning away. I remember he'd ask me for advice. He'd be like, do you think we should do this or this? I'd be like, we need to do this. Because if we don't do this, we're gonna have a crisis. He'd be like, I think we'll do this. I'd be like, why do you ask me? And then he would do that and it would be a crisis, and I, I thought it was on me to follow him around and remind him, you do remember I told you not to do that, right? You do remember that I told you this would be a mistake. And I thought John would just bow down and worship. I thought he would say, Lisa, you alone are wise and wonderful. I will draw from the wellspring of your wisdom for the rest of my life. But that's not what happened. He pulled away from me. He pulled away. And he felt insecure in his leadership. He felt insecure in his ability to provide. And I saw myself. And I, I don't know if the Holy Spirit's ever done this where you have a rewind. And I hated what I saw. I started to weep. I came running out of that shower. You know, normally I'd even try to brush my hair. I mean, it was like my hair was ratted, my nose is running. My husband was like, she just broke, she just broke. And my husband would always say, you need to break. I'd be like, buddy, you better hope I don't break because I'm the one holding everything. When I break, it all goes down. So anyway, he's like, he's like, okay. And I said, John, will you forgive me? I said, I thought, you guys, are, I'm gonna say the S word. I thought submission meant if I agreed with you, I followed you. But if I didn't agree with you, I fought you tooth and nail. I said, I don't, I'll quit my job tomorrow. I just want to be one again. And my husband looked at me and he said, you know what? You don't need to quit your job, but you do need to quit thinking you're the source. So you can be a stay-home mom and think you're the source and you'll be stressed out. Or you can work full-time and know God is still your source and you will have a peace that passes understanding. It is about where you're getting your life from. And, and I want you to know, we need to remember that men need us. And that is not a bad thing. I have so many, well, I'm going to just, what, you know what, go ahead, go ahead, be independent, be independent, or you can actually build a life that has legacy and love. Do you guys think I'm a weak woman? No, no, but I am in submission to my husband, and submission means under assignment. My husband and I are in agreement and on assignment to build a family and legacy that honors God and honors life.
So being submissive doesn't mean you take out your brain, lay down and let people walk on you. Matter of fact, it's probably harder to be submissive than it is to be contentious. So we need strong men. And I remember watching my husband go from a boy to a man when I stopped being his mother and I started to be his wife. I remember there was a season where John would say, what do you think I should do? And instead of telling him the right thing, I would say, I know you'll do the right thing. I, I, you know what, in my head it was going, he's not gonna do it. He's not gonna, <laughs> he's not gonna do it. He's gonna be bad, tell him, tell him. But I had to rebuild, I had to rebuild my husband's confidence that I actually believed in him. I had to stop being the most important, smartest, whatever person in the room. I had to get under him and begin to lift him. I had to be the guardian of his heart. I had to say, I will watch over your heart because you watch over my, my physical body. And so I began to watch my husband grow into a man that I now call my favorite husband. John's like, I'm your only husband. I'm like, but this version, this version is my favorite. This is my favorite version. I have, I've gone from having a husband who even when I was pregnant, like was, could not be bothered. Like I'd say, like I have a craving, be like, get your flesh under control. Okay, but now, now I have a husband who is like every, I was gonna have to have a horrible surgery on my feet without any guarantee that it was even gonna work. Like I had a friend that had the surgery and then her foot collapsed. I'm like, well, that doesn't sound fun. And then it also was like a 12 week recovery that does not work with my life. And my husband said, you know what? I will work on your feet every single night. He did not do that in labor. He did not do that when I was pregnant. I mean, if I even every single night, when we actually start to actually honor the husband we wish we had, instead of the nag the one that we have right now, when we begin to build the man up and we speak to who he can be, he will often rise to that level of expectation. I know I do. I know I do. When my husband met me, I had a suntan and a six pack, not of beer. I used to be buff. And he looked at me and said, I bet she'll be a great mom. I bet she'll be good with money. I bet she's a great cook. Well, I knew I was none of those things. Before he found out I was none of those things, I decided to try to grow into the likeness of that. You can do it with your sons. You can do it with your daughters. Now, I had uh, crazy parents. I think I mentioned that. My parents were married, divorced, remarried, divorced again. They're like divorcing in junior high with our oldest child wasn't enough. Let's do it again with our second born. And so my brother ended up coming and living with John and I when we were first married. There was all this craziness. And here's the truth. Knowing what you don't want to build is not enough to build what you do want to build. And so I thought, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to have a marriage like my parents. I don't want to be a mother like my mother, but I didn't know what to do or how to do it. And so I remember having my firstborn, being so in love with him, and then having my secondborn. You thought I'd forgotten about that. And I remember my husband would leave with the only car every single day, I would wave to him and say, pray for me, pray for me, and pray for the safety of your children. He'd be like, you're gonna be okay. I'm like, no, no, you need to pray for me. He'd be like, Lisa, you're going to be fine. He's like, you told me God told you to stay home. I said, pregnant women will say anything. They just, they just, they, they make promises because they're scared of the labor. You can't, you can't hold me to that. And every single day, John would come home and I'd be standing there with a child on my leg, a child in my arms, a spank spoon in my hands, and my nursing flaps down. And he would look at me and say, 
what did you do all day? And I would say, I don't know. I don't know, but I was busy, John. People are calling me, saying they're considering suicide, and I'm offering to join them. Stop asking me what I have done all day. Because my son, who had been an angel, he wanted to go down for a nap. Addison, he's alive. He's spoken at the Amsler's church. He's like, I don't want you guys to be afraid. Anyway, uh, he, he just refused. He refused to take naps when the new baby came. He's a firstborn. If I kissed the baby, I had to kiss him. If I said I love the baby, I had to love him. I mean, like, everything had to be evil. Everything had to be equal. And I just remember, I would put him down for a nap, and he would just keep getting up, keep getting up. Back then, we had phones on the wall wall. So if the phone rang, your kids knew you were trapped and they would just start running amok and he would be like running amok upstairs. People are talking to me. I'm stomping my feet, waving the spank spoon at him, like get back in your bed. And I'm like, yes, I'd love to pray for you. I mean, they have absolutely no idea like, why anybody would call a postpartum woman for prayer. I have no idea. These are desperate people. And one day Addison came down the stairs and I came running up to meet him. And I no longer saw a child. I saw an enemy. I thought this is the one who is keeping me from getting anything done. And I grabbed my son and I stormed up the stairs with him. And I looked around the room and I thought, what can I do to make sure he does not get off this bed? And I remember I Felt like I had a storm in my mind. And I heard, lift him up eye level, slam him into the wall and put him down in the bed. And I thought, yeah, that should probably do it. And I lifted him up eye level and I was just getting ready to slam my son into the wall when I saw something I'd never seen before. My son was not afraid of what I was going to do. He had no idea what I was going to do. He was afraid of me. And when I saw the fear in my son's face, I remembered my own growing up in a physically and emotionally abusive household. And every time I was hit, and every time I was kicked, and every time I was kneed or slapped or shoved, I made myself a promise. And it went like this. I will never treat my children this way. But there I was, a born again, spirit filled pastor's wife, about ready to slam my son into the wall. And it broke me. I put him down. I backed out of the room. I said, Alice, I'm so sorry. I scared you. And I hit the carpet. I said, God, it's not my husband. He's not here. It's not the Sicilian, it's not the witches, it's not my mom, it's not my dad, it's me. And I have a real problem with anger and I don't know how to get free. Have you ever cried until there's nothing? Until you're just empty? Because that day I did. And in the stillness I heard, because you're no longer justifying this, I'll take it out of your life. See, what you justify, you buy. You say, I've earned the right to be this way because of what was done to me. But here's the truth. You can live by what was done to you, or you can live by what was done for you. And it's going to take way more courage to live by what was done for you than it is going to take for you to live in your triggers and trauma. And you say, oh, Lisa, don't be mean. You don't understand. You think I don't understand? I am the child of a 100% Sicilian man who would put me on the wall. I lost an eye to cancer when I was five. I had an alcoholic father. My father grew up in poverty. We were poor when I was young. This is the world that we all inherit. It is a broken world. 
But what we have to do is we have to lay hold of the promises of God and say, yes, this has been my past, but it will not keep going on to the next generation's future. And that day, I remembered an incident that I'd had with my mother. When I was seven years old, my mother had my brother. And she sat me down and she said, who do you love more, me or your father? And I was like, I love you both the same. She said, no, you can't. I was like, I, I love you more. She said, no, you don't. I thought, okay, well, same was wrong. You was wrong. She wants me to say that I love dad more. So I said, well, okay, I, I love dad more. And she said, you know what? I knew it. And for the rest of your life, you're going to regret choosing your father over me. I will never be there for you when you need a woman. I will never be there for you when you are hurting. Then she picked me up, straddled me, and beat the living daylights out of me at seven. So what did I do? I hate my mother. I will not love my mother. I will only love my dog and my dad and my brother. I started to do these vows. Why do you think I didn't like women? It was because I had a wound between my mother and me. And my mother didn't get what she needed from her mother. And so she didn't have what she needed to give to me. But one generation finally says, I don't care if they don't give it to me. I'm going to get it from God. I am going to be the beginning of a thousand generations who love God and keep his commandments. You cannot afford to give anybody else that much power over you. We have the right to be generational women. We have the right to begin to fight. And so I want to close. They're like, is she going to ever use a scripture? Yes, I am. <laughs> when I was writing The Fight for Female, I realized that in the book of Exodus, and how many of you know right now, we need an Exodus. We need to go from the way things are, a land of captivity, of slave mentality, of bondage to trigger and trauma, to a walking through a wilderness where God is our only source, our only hope, our only direction, into a place where he takes us into the verge of a promised land. But when God begins to take people onto an exodus, he will actually begin to use women. I don't know if you're seeing what's going on in the body of Christ right now, there are quite a few people that I would like to spank or put into timeout. Okay, I have a young team. I have a young team. And with each grieving sin of a leader, it shakes them. When their fathers that they're looking up to, it shakes them. But a mother knows how to deal with things differently. So I went in to my team and I said, I'm gonna tell you a story. And they said, okay. Because they said, how can someone do this and then build that? How can someone do that and then build this? And I said, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story. What if you were starving and someone gave you a loaf of bread and then you found out a couple days later that the person that had gave you a loaf of bread had done something absolutely horrific would their actions make the bread bad? And they said, no, the bread would still be good. And I said, but does the bread make what they did right? And they said, no. And I said, if we're going to be wise stewards going forward, we need to be able to separate the gift from the minister. The anointing of God is never the approval of the character. The anointing of God is always for the people that the minister serves. And we have to separate that. There were two women that the king brought before them. Now we're talking about the heroes of Exodus. 
Because I believe that's what God is setting us up to be is women who are heroes. The first two women were brought before Pharaoh and he told them, he said, when the Hebrew women are on the birthing stool and they give birth to a son, kill the baby boy. Now I've always assumed, and maybe you assume the same way, that these were Hebrew midwives. But as I began to study, I learned that they actually were not Hebrew midwives. They were, they were Egyptian midwives because he would never draw the Hebrew women and tell them to kill their own people. And the Egyptian midwives served both the Egyptian women and the Hebrew women. And it said because they feared God, they let the boys live. And God said, because they feared him, he gave them households of their own. Some of you feel isolated and alone. Some of you have wrestled with barrenness. Some of you have not been able to conceive and carry to full term. But when you fear God, God will supersede culture. God will supersede natural circumstances. And he will give you a family of your own. So right now, I come against any barrenness and I break it off your life. I break any barrenness. I break any fear that the enemy has said, you'll never have a family. You'll never belong. I break that off of you. You will flourish because you fear the Lord. He gave them households and legacies. And then we got another female hero. And she was just a mother. Jochebed said she gave birth to Moses. He wasn't called Moses yet. She gave birth to him. And she just saw there was something on this child. It didn't say an angel appeared. It didn't say a prophet came to her house and said, save this one. It said she just saw him and she hid him. Now it's no longer about the midwives to kill the babies. Pharaoh has told all of the Egyptians, if you find out that the Hebrews have a baby boy, you turn them in, you take their babies, you drown their babies in the Nile. Can you imagine living under that kind of fear that you could have your child taken from you? But she saw something and she nursed that baby and she hid him away. And then when the time came, she made an ark for him. And that basket that she wove was an ark and she put him in the very river that was death to all the other children. But she didn't just put him anywhere. She put him strategically. She had his sister put him strategically where Pharaoh's daughter came to bathe. You think they didn't know where that place was? And Pharaoh's daughter said, whoa, whoa, she hears a baby cry. And her compassion opens up. She opens up this baby in the ark and she realizes it's a Hebrew child. And yet she defies her father and she saves this child. Do you know the midwives are the very first, very first ever recorded incident of civil disobedience? And it was to save life. Guys, we cannot be content to be quiet. We cannot be content to be contained. You need to understand that what is at risk on the other side, if we do not speak strength to our sons, strength to our daughters, strength to our husbands, strength to ourselves, and begin to ask God to show us the things that matter for him, because there is an exodus right now, and it isn't about who is elected. It is about when the elect people of God begin to return to him. We think it's election returns, and God says it's the elect returning. This is what God is focusing on right now. I'm not saying don't vote. You need to vote. You need to vote, and you need to vote in alignment with scriptures. You need to vote, if you're like, I don't know what scripture says, then vote according to the 10 commandments. If you don't know what to do, just look at those commandments. 
because I believe that in those commandments, you will find what you need. So what does it take? What does it take to be a hero? Psalm 16, verse three says, the godly people in the land are my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. We learn by doing. Heroes are born in battles. Hard seasons reveal where we place our trust and garner our strength. Heroes are made one choice at a time, one battle at a time. And godliness is created in us the same way. One God-honoring choice at a time. History is punctuated with moments when the battle lines were clearly drawn. But you cannot go into battle with unforgiveness. You cannot go into battle conflicted. When I had cried and God said to me, I'm gonna take this out of your life, he had me pick up the phone and he had me call my mother. Because see that incident from when I was seven, I had forgiven my mom of everything but that one. I thought, I'm just gonna tuck the one away in my heart because it'll keep me safe. And I called my mom and I said, Mom, I was weeping. I said, Mom, I almost hurt Addison today. And I said, Mom, I, I need you to forgive me. I don't know what life was like being married to an alcoholic and an adulterer. I don't know what kind of fear and tension you lived under. Can you forgive me for not forgiving you? And I remember God said, tell her, tell her the incident. I said, for that time when I was seven, now at that time I was 27. I had held on to something for two decades, two decades. I said, will you forgive me, mom? And, and I was crying and I was even ashamed. Two days earlier, I would have been like, you messed up my life. And she started to weep. And she said, Lisa, that's the one thing I've never been able to forgive myself for. But there's a reason for that. The sins that you retain, they are retained. And the sins that you remit, they are remitted. Guys, we cannot allow the sins of our families to keep going forward. We have to be courageous and forgive our mothers and forgive our fathers. When we know better, we do better. Sometimes all they did was all they knew to do. And so we have to say, I'm going to I'm gonna sow mercy because I need mercy. And when it comes to men right now, can I just be honest with you? You can't even think of the word masculinity without the idea of toxic in front of it. That's not right. Yes, there are men who have done toxic things, but there's also women who have done toxic things. And God does not want one image bearer attacking the other image bearer especially, especially when we are the ones that God has anointed to multiply, when we are the ones that God said, you can take what is not good and make it so very, very good. Do you understand that we are the guardians of the heart of our husband, our children, our home, our church, our city, our family? Do you understand there is no more noble commission than being a guardian of the heart. But instead of guarding our own hearts, a lot of us have imprisoned our hearts with unforgiveness and pain, and we've built up the walls that have been addressed a number of times. And the sad thing is when you, you imprison yourself, you put your heart on lockdown, and you stop experiencing the presence of God, the refreshing of the fellowship of believers, and so I, I want to commission you, but I first want to put my finger on your heart and make sure that you are not going forth in anger or vengeance. Because when we go forth with anger and vengeance, we end up being used by the enemy without even knowing it. So do I have any women who want to be female heroes? 
do I have any women who understand we need an exodus right now? That we need to leave the land of bondage and we need to walk into a season of promise. Do I have any women? Any, do, I have any, do I have any young mamas here? Wave at me. How many of you thought you were going to be perfect moms? Yeah. How many of you are perfect moms? Nobody. Okay. All right. Guys, we got to forgive our moms. We don't talk about mama wounds because we're women. And we feel like that's kind of attacking us. But if we can heal these mama wounds, that'll be really good. I've been hurt by men, but I've been wounded by women because I opened up my heart and let them get close. So if women can wound intimately, we can heal intimately. So can I get the women to stand up right now? I want you just to close your eyes. And I'm gonna tell you the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life is to forgive people I don't think deserve it. It's not prophesying. It's not sermon prep. It's not writing a book. It's not traveling and speaking. It's forgiving people that I'd rather punch. That is the most difficult thing I've ever done. But God is looking for agents of healing. God is looking for mothers and daughters who will release one another so that the bondage and the patterns of sin and unforgiveness from generations back is stopped. And we have a new generation that day, my mother and I prayed that the cycle of physical and emotional abuse would stop right then. And guess what? My children are even better parents than John and I. And that's what you want. Every generation building in beauty and strength upon the foundations laid by the forgiveness and godliness of the last generation. So I want you to say with me, Heavenly Father, I'm ready. I'm going to stop carrying unforgiveness, vengeance, and trauma. I'm going to pick up my sword. I'm going to pick up my shield. I'm going to put on my salvation helmet. And I'm going to stop having crazy thoughts. I'm going to renew my mind. I'm going to forgive people before they even ask for it. I'm going to bless people that I'd rather curse. I'm going to do good to people I'd rather hurt. Father, I believe that you need strong women. So I'm ready to do the heavy lifting. Father, you can count on me to walk in godliness one step, one moment at a time. And some of you are going to have to do something with that. Some of you are going to have to send a text message, make a phone call, write a letter. Some of you are going to have to put some feet to that. And that's okay. And maybe some of you, you're going to, you're going to do something beautiful and gracious. And maybe somebody's going to throw it back in your face. But it doesn't matter. You did what you can do. You cannot control the response of other people. You can choose your response to their hatefulness or their bondage, but it sets you free. I need you to be free, strong women. I need you to remember your divine origin of being an answer and not a problem. There is a reason why the enemy wants to distort every image of purity and femininity it's because Jesus is coming back for a bride. And so he is undermining it with promiscuity. We have virtue mocked as though it's vice right now. And right now we need to actually begin to be those examples for our world. It's been an incredible privilege for me to be here at the Adored Women's Conference. I'm believing that there are going to be a beginning of a thousand generations who love God and keep his commandments. I believe that you're going to fight the enemy 
at the gate and that the children that you have born are going to inherit God's promises and not your fears and failures. I believe that you are going to see things go further and farther than you ever could have imagined. I believe that as we become one, God is going to anoint us to see signs and wonders and miracles. I believe right now in this room that we have some women, and you're not, you don't put up your hand, but I believe in this room that we have some women that have been afflicted with an STD. And it has shut down your ability to conceive and carry life. Well, I break the shame off of you and I send the Word of God into your womb and into your body. I thank you, Father, that Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, all my soul and all my inmost being. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all my sins do you believe that God forgives all our sins but he, go, he doesn't stop there and heals all my diseases who redeems my life from destruction who renews my youth like the eagle who crowns my life with his mercy and his love I thank you father that the legacies that the enemy tried to steal are restored in Jesus name I speak a cleansing and I want all the women to say be it unto us according to your word in Jesus name